welcome to The Code Tray, the podcast of the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMEDPRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the Libraries Entry section of the ACCP Communities website. Um, so our next presenter today is going to be Harrison Hamada. He's a PGY2 critical care resident at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And today he's going to be presenting on Atomidate versus Ketamine as a pre-hospital induction agent in patients with suspected intracranial injury. Before we start, myself nor my mentor for this presentation, Dr. Vivian Coombe, have anything to disclose concerning possible conflicts of interest related to the presentation. So just a few objectives. Our objectives will be to describe the advantages and disadvantages of atomidate and ketamine as individual induction agents, to review relevant literature that assesses ketamine's effect on intracranial pressure or ICP and cerebral perfusion, and lastly, to critique a retrospective study which investigated the use of etomidate and ketamine as induction agents in the setting of severe traumatic brain injury, or TBI. So a little bit of background information. We know that intubation, specifically pre-hospital endotracheal intubation, is performed for a variety of reasons, including to prevent airway obstruction, to prevent hypercapnia, hypocapnia, and hypoxia. Now, induction itself is an important step that we need in order to suppress airway reflexes, improve intubation conditions, and prevent awareness in the patient undergoing intubation. Now, what would the ideal induction agent look like in the setting of traumatic brain injury? I think ideally, we would want an agent that has minimal hemodynamic effects and side effects in order to ultimately preserve cerebral perfusion. Some common induction agents that are included in this study, and we'll talk about are atomidate and ketamine. So to first talk about atomidate, we know it is a GABA receptor agonist that is usually dosed at 0.3 milligrams per kilogram IV push. In terms of its pharmacokinetics, it has a relatively quick onset and short duration, with the onset being 10 to 15 seconds and duration being up to 10 minutes. Some important notes for the sake of this talk will be that Atomidate is rather hemodynamically neutral. It can have some side effects, including myoclonus, adrenal suppression, and decreased intracranial pressure and and preservation of cerebral perfusion. Now, this preservation of cerebral perfusion that is rather known for does make it a rather appealing agent in the setting of a traumatic brain injury where we're trying to prevent any kind of further injury. Now, ketamine, on the other hand, is an NMDA receptor antagonist that works by decreasing glutamate's activity. We typically would dose it one to two milligrams per kilogram IV push over 30 to 60 seconds. In terms of its pharmacokinetics, it has a little bit longer of an onset and a little bit longer of a duration compared to Adomidate with the onset being anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds and duration going up to 15 minutes. Some important notes is it does have some sympathomimetic properties and a little bit of cardiovascular depression. Some important key adverse effects may be laryngospasm. It does have a rather strong analgesic potency effect. And historically, it's been thought to increase intracranial pressure. We'll talk a little bit of evidence about that historical perspective in a couple of slides. Now, for this study that we're going to be talking about, it did a little sneak peek. It did take place in Europe where they're using the S enantiomer of ketamine. So just to compare the S enantiomer to the racemic version of ketamine, which we are he- using here in the US, the S enantiomer does have a higher affinity for the NMDA receptor binding site and does have four times higher anesthetic potency. Now, when we look at their effects on certain hemodynamics, like blood pressure, catecholamine release, cerebral perfusion, cerebral blood volume, and cerebral metabolic oxygen rate rate of oxygen, it does actually appear to be comparable to the racemic version. So since we said we really care about cerebral perfusion and the setting of TBI, we would probably expect similar results for both of these agents in the setting of TBI. And important to note and consider that this racemic version does actually contain roughly 50% of that S enantiomer. 
So a little bit about the background literature and his, we'll talk about why ketamine has been associated with these increases in ICP. This first study at the top is a case series that is done in the early 1970s, which looked at two subjects who were undergoing diagnostic and minor neurosurgical procedures. Now, the first subject was an eight-year-old and the second being a 17-year-old. Both of these subjects received a dose of ketamine at two milligrams per kilogram, which ended up being 60 milligrams in the eight-year-old and 180 milligrams in the 17-year-old. Now, when they tracked the changes in intracranial pressure for these two subjects, they noted that the eight-year-old did experience um, some acute increases in ICP. Now, the 17-year-old, when they looked, experienced only small, rather small fluctuations in that ICP. Now, just to note, they, they did mention in the study that the eight-year-old had signs of increased ICP before actually receiving this ketamine. Now, this next study is a retrospective analysis of a multicenter randomized control trial, or the TXA for TBI trial, which came out a, last year in 2023. And this study looked at 841 out-of-hospital subjects with TBI. In terms of an intervention, they looked at ketamine exposure, which they defined as any recorded ketamine administration by emergency medical services or EMS. Now for their results, when they compared these two groups, they noted a mortality of 12.2% in the ketamine exposed group versus 15.5% in the non-exposed group with a p-value of 0.391, indicating no significant difference in mortality between these groups. Now, when we look down at ICP greater than 20 millimeters of mercury, which is really reflective of any acute increases in ICP, this occurred in 56.3% of the ketamine exposed group versus 82.3% in the non-exposed group with a p-value of 0 0.048. So actually they noticed a significantly higher rate ICP increases in the non-exposed group. Important to note that subjects in the ketamine group in this study were younger overall, had worse GCS scores, and were intubated at a higher rate. So ultimately, what we can take away from this slide is there's a lot of historical data from the early 1970s, mostly case series or rather small sample size studies that looked at acute increases in ICP with ketamine. And there's some more recent data that suggests that maybe it doesn't increase ICP to the effect that we thought it did. So with that in mind, the purpose of the study we're looking at today will be to investigate the association between the choice of anesthetic induction medication whether that be atomidate versus ketamine, and mortality in patients with su suspected severe traumatic brain injury who received pre-hospital anesthesia in the Netherlands. Now, in terms of study design, this is a retrospective analysis of the Brain Protect study. Now, the Brain Protect study was actually a prospective observational study that focused on the pre-hospital management of severe TBI in the Netherlands. Now, this study really focused on patients from Brain Protect who underwent pre-hospital advanced airway management or intubation, who received either etomidate or the s enantiomer of ketamine as induction agents. Now, they did include suspect subjects with a suspected severe TBI who were treated by Dutch helicopter emergency medical services. And all of these helicopter EMS services did have a physician provider on board. The study took place from February 2012 to December 2017, with follow-up occurring in the patients all the way through 2018. Now, for in terms of inclusion criteria, they included all patients with a suspected severe TBI, and they defined this suspected severe TBI as a combination of an experience of any kind of trauma with a pre-hospital GCS score of eight or less. And they also had to be treated by the helicopter EMS services. And I think the rationale for using suspected rather than confirmed TBI is that this pre-hospital treatment, which they're focused on and what we're focused on today, is really based on the suspected rather than definitive diagnosis of TBI. Now, in terms of exclusion, they excluded a variety of patients, including anyone who was declared dead on the scene, anyone who had a possible brain injury where TBI was not suspected as a result of things such as suffocation or drowning, if there was missing data on which induction agent was actually used, anyone who experienced pre-hospital cardiopulmonary resuscitation, anyone who was essentially not intubated, 
and anyone who received both ketamine and etomidate in that pre-hospital setting. Now, with that in mind, they chose, for well, in terms of outcomes, for the primary outcome, they chose to use 30-day mortality with secondary outcomes, including systolic blood pressure after induction, Glasgow outcome scale score at discharge, length of hospital stay, and length of ICU stay. Now, they did have a rather robust statistical analysis that will become clear as we go over some of the results for the various outcomes, but just a couple important notes to mention here. In terms, they did a priori calculations on that original Brain Protect data set. And when they performed these calculations, they said that any secondary analysis of this data were to require at least 1,500 subjects to have 80 to be 80% powered in order to detect a 6.4% difference in mortality. We'll see how close they got to this on the next slide. They also performed a Kaplan-Meier analysis in order to estimate survival in subjects for up to one year after the trauma, so extending past that 30-day mortality primary outcome. And they also performed a multivariable logistic regression for 30-day mortality in order to adjust for various demographic variables to account for a lot of potential confounders. So when we take a look at the subject enrollment, we see that they started with 2,589 patients from the Brain Protect database. And right off the bat, they excluded 472 due to transfers of non, they were transferred to non-participating trauma centers. This left 2,117 patients eligible for inclusion of which 290 were excluded because they received cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Another 254 were excluded because they were missing data on which induction agent was used. 71 of these patients actually were never intubated and 51 received both ketamine and etomidate in the pre-hospital setting. So after removing all these excluded patients, this left them with 1,451 subjects, which, although it's not at that 1,500 mark that they were looking to achieve, is nearly there and is a rather large sample size. So when we take a look at the patient characteristics overall, I'll orient you to the middle two columns, the patients received etomidate and ketamine. Now, the baseline characteristics are rather comparable between these two groups, and the only significant difference we see is that subjects in the ketamine group had a significantly higher heart rates at an average of 100 beats per minute as compared to 90 beats per minute in the Atomidate group with a p-value of less than 0.001. Now, when we look at the population as a whole overall on that far left column, we see that the median age for the population was 45 years of age. Uh, a majority of the subjects were male at 70.1%. The median injury severity score was 26 and the median first GCS score was four. Now the bottom half of this table does include a lot of outcome data that we'll kind of sum up and go over on the next few slides. So when looking at our primary outcome, which was that 30 day mortality, they performed quite a few different statistical tests and analyses in order to look at this outcome. Now, the first of which is it, their standard unadjusted comparison. And when they did this, they saw a 32.9% rate of 30-day mortality in the automate group versus 33.8% in the ketamine group with a p-value of 0.716, indicating no significant differences in terms of 30-day mortality between etomidate and ketamine. Now, they also performed an unadjusted logistic regression, which generated an odds ratio of 1.04 with a p-value of 0.711, indicating no significant difference again. And lastly, they performed a multivariable logistic regression to try and you know, adjust for some of those confounders. And again, they see an odds ratio of 1.08 with a p-value of 0.765, indicating no significant difference. I didn't include it on this slide, but they also performed another post hoc sensitivity analysis where they used inverse probability of treatment weighting. And essentially, this analysis again noted no significant differences between the two groups in terms of 30 day mortality. Now, they did, we did mention they followed these patients up for one year after they received treatment. And we see here this is the one year survival probability in terms of a Kaplan Meier survival analysis for both groups. 
Now, when we just look at it graphically, the survival over one year appears comparable between both etomidate and ketamine. And when they ran a log rank test, they generated a p-value of 0.324, indicating no significant difference in terms of survival probability at that one year mark. So overall, they cannot find any significant differences in terms of mortality outcomes between the two agents. Now, when they look at the secondary outcomes, they performed a few different complex statistical analyses and tests for each one of these outcomes, which we won't go into, but they did do unadjusted analyses, which we can see on the left side of this chart and adjusted analyses on the right side. So we'll first look at the unadjusted analysis on the left. And in terms of post-induction systolic blood pressure, Glasgow outcome scale score at discharge, length of hospital stay, and length of ICU stay, there was no significant differences between our atomidate and ketamine group with all these p-values going beyond 0.05. Now, after they tried to adjust for any kind of potential confounders on the right in all their adjusted analyses, the results are a little different. However, in terms of post-induction systolic blood pressure, Glasgow outcome scale score at discharge, and length of ICU stay, there was no significant difference. Where we do see a difference is in the length of hospital stay. So after they adjusted for these potential confounders, they saw significantly longer lengths of hospitalization in the ketamine group. Now, this next table really focuses on some subgroup analyses that they wanted to investigate. And what they did was they performed another logistic regression for 30-day mortality. So we'll first look at the logistic regression in two of the subgroup analyses in question, which were both confirmed TBI and isolated TBI. We noted that the initial total analysis was done on suspected TBI. So when we look at confirmed TBI, they generated an odds ratio of 1.07 with a p-value of 0.792, indicating no significant differences between our two agents again. And similarly, in the isolated TBI subgroup, they generated an odds ratio of 0.82 with a p-value of 0 0.520, indicating no significant difference. Now, they performed another inverse probability of treatment weighting analysis and again looked at the same subgroups. Similarly to what we saw above, there was no significant differences between the two agents in either of these subgroups with this analysis as well. Now, what you see at the bottom of this chart is they did multiple imputations again, and similarly to what they saw above, there was no significant differences between our agents. So based on all this information, the authors conclude that they, there was no significant difference in mortality, length of ICU, or functional status at discharge between patients with suspected severe TBI who received etomidate or the S enantiomer of ketamine for pre-hospital induction. Now, in terms of some critiques for this study, I think there are definitely some strengths. Although it didn't hit that 1500 goal that they sought to achieve when they started the study, it, they did have a rather large sample size of nearly 1500. Also, they chose a clinically relevant outcome. Investigating mortality here is kind of unique because historically, a lot of the evidence that looked at ketamine as an induction agent in the setting of TBI really focuses on ketamine's effect on ICP as a surrogate marker. So this is, is a rather unique approach that they were able to achieve using that brain, brain protect data. Now, they also did have a rather robust statistical analysis, as you saw in how many times they analyzed the primary outcome and the different methods that they used to analyze all of their secondary outcomes. I think this is a strength for a lot of reasons, but could also be seen as a limitation in terms of it can be rather hard to interpret at times and it might be a little unclear as to how they created and generated, how they ran some of these tests on some outcomes. Now there's some limitations. It is a retrospective study in nature and it is a secondary retrospective analysis of an observational study, which was the Brain Protect study. So since this is really that secondary analysis of an observational study, there are a lot of confounding factors here. So for example, you see this last bullet point is lack of dosage standardization. So since we didn't have any kind of dose information, we don't really know exactly how they were dosing these patients. So there's a lot of other things that are unknown with some of these patients that could serve to be confoundings. 
which is probably a driving factor as to why they had such a robust statistical analysis. I think there also is a lack of generalizability. This did take place in the Netherlands where their helicopter EMS are adequately trained and do have a provider on board and may not function as the same pre-hospital system that we have here in the U.S. Also, they did use the s and of ketamine, which we use the racemic version of ketamine. And although we said we would probably expect similar results on terms of its effect on ICP and cerebral perfusion, I think we'd really like to see that in a study. So to wrap things up, I think we can conclude that in the setting of severe TBI, there appears to be no significant difference in clinically relevant outcomes between etomidate and the s and of ketamine when used as pre-hospital induction agents. Now, in terms of some clinical implications and future directions, clinical implications, I think this does serve as a contributing piece of evidence to this notion that maybe ketamine is safe in the setting of TBI and doesn't cause as strong and acute of elevations in ICP as historically been thought. However, I do think we'd like to see a lot, some more prospective studies, maybe in even different settings, not just the pre-hospital settings, but in the hospital setting as well. Also, I think there's a lot of important outcomes in severe TBI, any TBI patients being long-term functional outcomes that weren't discussed in this study, and I think could be another direction that this could be taken. Also, I think is there room for S-ketamine here in the U.S. or keep using racemic mixture? It's hard to tell, but I think we would need more studies using racemic ketamine in a similar fashion to what we looked at here in order to determine this. But with all that in mind, I'd like to thank my mentor for this presentation, Dr. Vivian Kuhn, and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you may have. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest, and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.